there and welcome to today's um, episode of the Disrupt Ed interviews and today we are chatting to the fabulous Natasha Hemida who joins us from Rotatuna Senior School and who is also of course one of the co-founders of the Disrupt Ed community here on Facebook. Hey Tash, how are you going? Really good, thank you Claire. Namahi nui kia koutou katoa. Um, as Claire said, ko Natasha Hemida tōku ingoa and I am fortunate enough to be the principal at Rotatuna Senior High School, which is in North Hamilton. Some people get it a bit mixed up with Rotorua, but it's in North Hamilton, and we are um, a very large school now. Um, co you know, two high schools together, about 2,200 students on site. Um, but the senior high school, we've got um, about 700 students on site this year. And how long have you been open as a senior school? Is this your third or fourth year this year? Fourth? Fourth. This is our fourth year of operation. Yeah, my first year um, that I was in Hamilton was really about setting the school structures up while they built the school, developing our curriculum, um, hiring a great team around me, and um, then setting in place our school. We've had the... Um, but I suppose you, I would call it luxury, actually, of being able to start one year group at a time. So year 11s, first, 12s, and year 13s was our first cohort. We only had 86 in that first cohort. So this year probably is, is more reflective of our full cohorts of year 11, 12, and 13. And in terms of um, the character of the school, how would you describe Rotatuna? What, what makes you different from other schools around the country? Um, I'm not sure that we really are that different. I think that our curriculum that we offer might um, look more flexible than other curriculums may, um, but I think our community um, and our board and our philosophy very much encapsulate that um, idea that we want personal and academic success for our students, that we want to work with our community to ensure that we're being responsive to their needs, but also looking, making sure that we're outward facing enough to um, recognise how community plays a bigger part in education, being really um, engaging with innovative approaches, future focus, um, skill acquisition for our students so that we're not just teaching subjects. And that probably is where we get a little bit more flexible and responsive and I'd say more personalised in our approach to our, with our learners. Um, so we do do level two um, as our prioritised programme of work for the majority of students um, for over two years. Um, and then obviously level three can look different ways um, depending on where your students are at. So your traditional um, school might say actually everyone focuses on getting NCA level three and UE. Well, hopefully we know our learners and know our families enough by the time we get to year 13 that we wouldn't want to put students through a pathway that they did not ever want to access. So I'd say that we're quite um, responsive and open um, to developing personalised programs with and for our students. Awesome. And you also um, do a number of co-taught integrated modules alongside some single subject modules, don't you? And you've got your project-based learning as well. Yep, yep. So um, I like to think we're very hybrid in the way our curriculum looks based on, you know, the research and the things that we visited and the people we saw and the learnings we take from other colleagues. Um, and being able to say, well, actually, what was it that was important to enable us to connect, inspire and soar with our young people? Um, what were those interpretations and what does that look like in a curriculum? So um, really, first up, at the beginning, really important to us to have whanaungatanga. Relationships matter. Um, all of the research around um, all learners, Māori Pacifica, um, Asian European, uh, all sorts of different ethnicities, relationships matter first. And so that was probably what I'd call the skeleton um, mm. of our curriculum, the bones of it, is underpinned by a deep advisory program, um, which will look really interesting online, and we'll probably get to that. Um, and then the other parts of filling the meat and the sinew into, into the body of um, curriculum is looking at our modules of learning. Um, which are collaborative, so two subjects working together, but it wasn't about just making or asking two subjects to marry themselves together. The underpinning why of that was to create authenticity of learning for young people. 
so that when they are connecting experiences of learning, they can connect them to other things in their, in their own world because they've been able to seen it, see it demonstrated in a real life way in front of them. So it was never about we just want teachers to work together collaboratively. It was actually this is a way that we feel will support one our teachers to challenge their mindsets around um, integrated types of learning. And we probably don't call it integrated. We actually use the terms connected more. Yep. So how do we connect learning a little bit better? Um, and how do we support teachers on a journey? Because we can't change the world of um, education completely from what our staff know and our students know to something completely different. We have to take them along that journey. And, and part of that interpretation was around doing um, having two modules work together. Um, and then our other part of our program is our project pathway space, which allows for our um, secondary tertiary partnerships, our gateways, our students wanting work experience and internships, um, but also those students that want to get their something their teeth stuck into working in a community engaged way. And I think we've got a pretty authentic context going on around us at the moment. Mm -hmm. Can lead us to be really responsive to supporting those. Um, what does um, it was Rosemary Hipkins called it the wicked problems, didn't she? Yes. Yeah. So you know, looking at those sorts of things in a real authentic way. So taking that module stuff of learning in connected way, but actually having another opportunity in the learning to explore what connected might look like in another situation. Awesome. And so obviously we've been thrown into um, a new normal very rapidly over the last few weeks. And um, I know when we were talking um, online before this interview, you were talking about the fact that you actually were looking at pandemic plans um, uh, anyway this year. And, and, and so we're in a, in a sense you'd seen into the future and managed to front foot some of your planning. And I know that um, early on before, you know, as we were, it was becoming clear that we should be getting ourselves ready for potentially going remote. I know one of the really um, important conversations I had was with one of your deputy principals, Hemi, who was talking about the idea of asynchronous teaching and learning online that I know informed um, a lot of our thinking as an SRT when we were planning for going remote. So um, can you tell us a little bit about, um, obviously, we've only had a short period of remote teaching and learning happening with it being the school holidays. But could you tell us a little bit about how Rotatuna um, went about getting prepared for going online and, and what you've been doing so far? Yeah, I think um, there's probably two layers to what was happening. There was one at a um, structural level of the mm. school in terms of is the school ready? How do we communicate with our families? What are the structures we want to engage in? And so that was really, I would say, probably at my level. And um, because I've got with these two principals on our site, Fraser and I, um, with our board, and we've been really lucky to have um, Catherine Charles, who's one of our, is our nurse. And she's been exceptional in this space and has actually been able to say, actually, let me deal with some of this information that we're getting and support and preparedness. You guys manage this and I'll manage this. And so we've really um, approached it in a, from a team perspective. And I think mm. that's where a school like ours, that does function a little bit differently in our leadership, um, that we're prepared and, and able to do that. So to put that into perspective, when you have two principals on the site, um, what what I I do is I lead the health and safety sides of things, and Fraser leads the policy and processes for both of our schools. Oh and wow! So we can divide and conquer. Mm. So neither of us has to replicate something, and um, we have to just develop, review, and refine and share across the two schools. And so we were able to get started on that structural space really early on, which leads me to being able to that second layer work with my team. Um, and sometimes both teams around how do we communicate effectively with our parents so we're get, getting one voice, um, how do we get the information from our families to know where they're at with devices, internet, support, um, how do we go online for a range of different things. And so at the moment, behind the scenes in this apparent holiday time, we've got working what our curriculum will look like online, how to support our teachers and what that looks like for them, as well as communicating that to our families and our um, students. And then also how do we go online with our counselling, our yes. nursing, our um, 
all of the different structures that our school runs by. So we're not just doing learning because we espouse an idea that it's about the whole individual and their mm. well-being needs to be catered to. And so making sure we've got systems to allow for all of that to still continue without having to be face-to-face -face is important. Well, face-to-face -face and body. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, face to face online has still been incredibly important, hasn't it? And yeah. so, so, can you give us a bit of a once over, lightly? And I realise this is probably still evolving, as it will be for all schools at the moment. But a once over, lightly, of what um, online teaching and learning, whilst looking after the whole child, looks like at Rotatuna Senior High School. Yeah, so um, my team and I sat down actually last week and had a really good um, what we call a buff buff session. You know that. <laughs> No, you we don't do no buff buff. Back <laughs> into ideas and interrogate them and then come out the other side and go, oh, okay, I like that, I don't like that. And unless you really interrogate something um, through all spectrums of what that might look like, you don't necessarily come out with what I call the gold nuggets no. or, or the wins. And so we had a, our little session last week around, okay, what, what is it that's important? Um, you know, we can't help but look to see this as a possible opportunity. Yeah. I've already seen some opportunity arise um, that I've always been concerned with, and that's equity. And equity, and, you know, I, I sit in a privileged position where our, the majority of our school have devices and internet access, blah, blah, blah. Not fair. Actually, yeah. no one should have to say that they're okay in another school. It's not. So yeah. um, I think that isn't it awesome that the ministries all of a sudden finally yeah. got Money, sorting that out a little bit more equitable for everyone yeah. and um too late should happen years ago but i'm going to take this gift and yeah. i thank corona for that um so i won't thank it for much but i'll thank it for that um so you know we we talk we've been thinking about what is actually important what is important learning for our young people right now what do they need to get through what's going to be the stresses um for our for our whanau and for our students and for our teachers and we have to find a balance there. So whilst I can say that, yes, this is an opportunity, we can go here, we can go here and here, actually, we have to rein some of that in and go, yeah, potential can be had here. Yeah. But most of all, we've got to look at the people we have with us. Because if we truly know our learners the way that we say, we should know our families and we should know our teachers in the same way. So, you know, um, when we've looked at that and engaged in a space that has expectation because we have high expectations of our learners and of our staff to present and do the best that we can for our kids, what is that going to look like in this space? And so we've come up with these two key pillars. You know, actually, Tanga matters, and so does actually making sure their needs are met. Yeah. And that might be having to um, change our focus in the way that we look at NCEA to be a bit more standards-based focus and yeah. look at what are the learnings that can go on to ensure that the young person is able to still access what they need and make sure that the students are supported in a mentoring, coaching capacity to understand where they're at with that learning. Yeah. Um, I think that's the balance. So we can't assume that kids can know that themselves and that their teachers can provide that one-on-one -on -one with them. We have an advisory system that allows us to connect with the kids to enable that one-on-one -on -one connection to occur. So learning doesn't look like a replication, augmentation type of scenario that I'm going to sit in front of my screen and teach you the way I would have. I think if we ask us, our teachers to do that, that's been unkind and not necessarily thinking about what their world looks like. Totally. You know, we've, had touch, we've had touch bases with all of our staff. Those staff that are coping are those that are home and single or with their flatmates and, yeah. are, and they've got time, and that's great. But actually, a lot of our staff and a lot of our families, including our whanau at home with our kids, have got babies to look after, have got essential workers that are still going to yeah. work have got to manage time and space and place. And I think we all need to understand each other a little bit better in this space. So our mums that want us to get this work online yesterday, yeah, I want to help you, but actually I need you to understand that there's someone else in exactly the same place as you. And how do we stop this and actually work together on that same yeah. page? And so, I'm with you 110%. Yeah. yeah, so I think what we 
able to do right um actually before we even i actually think the day we closed yeah um, was to actually send that information out to parents so we already had a clear understanding of where we were going to go to support all of our learners and our staff so we sent out a communication to parents staff and students which outlined all of our expectations so we feel the clearer um, and the more we communicate in an open honest and clear way with our community yeah the better people will understand the perspective so yeah. um, i've been really upfront about that that everyone's well-being matters that if our teachers can get work up online at 10 30 um, in the day for kids then i'm all good with that yeah um, if that doesn't happen, then please contact us and let us know and we'll work with that whānau or that staff member to help them and support them to, to work through that. Um, so we've put layers in place to allow that. So it's not just Tash ringing around everyone or her DPs ringing around. Actually, we've got a really um, horizontal leadership that runs in our school and I'm really glad for it now because upskilling people and supporting people to be um, leaders in this time is really important and so we ask that all of our teams step up and support and know their team yeah. you know talk about knowing our students well we need to talk about knowing our staff as well yeah incredible opportunity for agency across the board isn't it like yeah. growing student agency and learner agency but also developing real sense of teacher agency and those teachers as leaders and middle leaders taking yeah. ownership and being okay to be flexible. I think mm. um, as leaders in schools, particularly at senior leadership level, we have to be responsive and flexible. We need to be able to be agile ourselves yeah. and not stick to the, oh, this is the way we've done it. We must do it actually a little bit more than that. So we have had a rule in our school um, and I'm, I'm rethinking that. And the rule was we didn't want to um, email people on weekends and on evenings because we understand that sometimes people need that space and by having that um, clear expectation across the board, we all understood that. That might now, ha now have to shift. Yeah. And it may have to shift because actually not everyone can Google Meet at 10 o'clock. You know, if I set a meeting up with my department and say, look, can we meet at 12? Maybe I've not been considerate of who yeah. those people are in that learning area that might say, have a baby that it's not when baby rests. Actually, yeah. I've got a couple of infants at home that I have to look after. Actually, that's the time because I'm someone else's care person that I need to go and drop them off or pick up their shopping for them. So we, we've, I think we have to be able to be really flexible um, but we can only do that if we understand our people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as I think you touched on a really important thing, the idea that our expectations are going to evolve. Like I, I know yeah. even in our, we sent out really clear expectations as well for our staff and our students um, prior to the lockdown happening. And we're already talking about expectations 2.0 because we've realised very quickly that... Um, that set of expectations served us then because actually those first three days was all about well-being and all about people getting home and safe and us being totally understanding that, you know, they were only going to engage if and when they could and how they could mm -hmm. and actually that what really mattered is that they were okay and they were safe and they were healthy and those sorts of things. And we've recognised now that that worked then but it's not going to work if, say, we end up with two, three, four, five weeks of um, remote teaching and learning. So we've developed a 2.0 set of expectations which have a little bit more check-in time because I know one thing I'm really concerned about is how we make sure we connect with all of our learners and that we have mechanisms by picking up on the learners who do disengage because we found this platform really works for some learners and in fact, they're more engaged than ever and feel more comfortable than ever. And then there's that part of our school community where they've seen it as a chance of, Whoa, they can't yeah. find me. They're not going to find me. I'm just going to sit over here um, totally. and disengage completely. Totally. And I've had um, feedback back from some staff where students have gone, no, nah, I'm just not interested. Yeah. Don't ask me. You're not getting anything from me. And <laughs> we have to work through that and yeah. <laughs> be able to support a young person um, with all of the change that's going on in their life that may have struggled within our schooling system anyway. Um, so, you know, I think um, Stuart Middleton called them your, your disengaged attenders. So they're, they're present, but they're absolutely disengaged in the learning and they exist and, and we're constantly striving and looking at ways to support them. I suppose I've got a couple of 
things that I know in the back of my mind we're going to have to be really responsive to, and that's um, around the NC, NCEA space. Yeah. Um, I think I know my students will be nervous, and I know my um, families will be nervous. Um, I've been a bit disappointed, to be honest, that the communication we've had has been pretty <laughs> Um, if in fact anything can be read into it at all. So um, yes, I know it's early days, but I hope in the next um, week or so that we get some really um, clear, positive advice around how do we support our um, communities as they move forward around that space. You know, um, I look to my colleagues and other schools that might be trying to access a, a certificate in one year. Now, I've yeah. been advocate for getting rid of that for a very long time because you can't measure and you can't measure learning in a year. Um, no. We expect that everyone learns at the same rate. I've always thought that that's ridiculous and we should have got rid of it a while ago. Yeah. Um, but that still is in place um, at this present time because it serves as mechanisms for people to compare and look at data and those sorts of things. The Metro Magazine's gone though, so sweet. <laughs> Clear, clear, clear. <laughs> Rain I'm, not, I'm not celebrating that. No, no, but but you know those um, looking at true um, understanding of how we can gather information around the lunar and what they've done, um, yeah. what we can see that they've done, but what they've been able to access that's quality, and I think that sometimes where we forget um, when we're gathering evidence, we might sometimes gather evidence that they got there, but actually. This is where we want to be gathering evidence at that yeah. high level, which is why we go down the road that we've gone down of two years of NCA Level 2, so that we can um, support the learners to get deeper and get higher quality outcomes, which we are seeing. We, we yeah. have an exceptional amount of um, merit and excellence endorsements because of the approach that we take. And the time that um, we take as well. Because I, yeah. I reckon as well, I don't think you can underestimate the power of the Ministry and NZQA fronting up and actually recommending the two-year pathway. Because I know whilst it's always been an option for you to not do Level 1, for those schools where they are still doing traditional Level 1, 2 and 3, it's a huge ask for them to suddenly pivot off their own back um, and step away from that more traditional approach. Because you know, if that was the case, they would have probably done it already. Um, and so I, I do think there's a really incredible opportunity for our minister and ministry to show some real courage um, in terms of the messaging. And it doesn't necessarily mean, do, you know, making massive changes to, you know, the actual policy because it's, it's an option already. But imagine if they formally um, and unilaterally recommended a two-year pathway for Level 1. That would make a massive difference. Imagine it. And I think that would be positive. Um, yep. The optimist in me says actually fantastic. But I get it. I mm. know how it works. And I've had to work with a, a staff to take them through that change process. And I know how um, difficult that has been and how exciting it was for them to be on the journey. But the struggle that's gone on between. And I, I wonder around the timing and mm. around well-being for people so the realist in me says great um but how might we do that so it has less impact on people yeah. rather than more um i think the the other space that i think about um in there claire is around that equity that i brought on before and i've um, been reading quite a lot of Anne milne's work lately around um coloring the white spaces and her yeah. new the paper that she's just put out recently around colouring the virtual white spaces and um, you know one of the key things that of what I understand about what works for Māori and, and, and in some cases Pacifica learners but I'll talk mainly about Māori um, learners is that whanaungatanga and actually people knowing me and understanding me and recognising where I come from um, and I think it's really important in this time that schools really consider that. Yes. That having a Māori context is not the only answer. That actually understanding the ways and knowing of being for Māori is really important. And I worry um, that we might not be putting that as big on the scope of importance um, that we should um, when we're putting out some, you know, good communication to community. So yeah. the ministry, to me, 
has a really um, big part to play in ensuring that diversity, equity and those sorts of conversations are being had so all learners can access um, learning in a way that is actually responsive to their needs. Yeah, and I think there's a really big piece as well. Um, it makes me think of the shift that we've just seen with the Education Act and the fact that the um, our boards of trustees are no longer supposed to just be asking us to report on um, academic achievement. They're supposed to be asking us to report on the implementation of um, Tiriti or Waitangi. They're supposed to be asking us um, around how we're making sure that teaching and learning is inclusive and that health and well-being side of things as well. And and I think health and well-being, because of the context that we're in, um, has been upfront for people. Um, I think you're right that there's a real challenge around um, the, the treaty and um, te ao Māori lens in this space. And I also think there's some real challenges about how we're really genuinely meeting the needs of our diverse learners um, in this space as well. And because, so in their stories, you know, because mm. once upon a time, and, um, you know, and the ministry still asks for our target data and our analysis of variance, well, actually, this year I said, nah, stuff you, I'm not doing it. Um, because actually that, that is only one small piece of what yeah. we want to work on with our individuals. Actually, we gather pathways data on our students. It matters to me where my kids go. Yeah. You know, and, and that what they wanted to do, they're able to access. And so I've started reporting to the board, and our board has been extremely responsive around personal success and yes. academic success. And then we've got a lot of work to do still around what that graduate profile looks like, if that's a term that we want to use. Um, and how are we determining what quality added value to a kitty looks like for a young person? So it might be academia and it might yeah. be achievement, and that might mean mana to haki, high expectations for one individual, but it also might mean actually gaining an understanding of where I want to go in life or actually when I leave school, I've had a chance to try multiple um, avenues of work and I've got myself um, a job. Yeah. Um, so measuring that, and that's the data we are now producing, um, albeit in its um, beginning phase, foundation phase, but I think we've got a um, responsibility to play at um, making sure that we can measure success in our schools beyond just NCEA achievement data. That's an easy, that's an out. We can all gather data and present it and show who got it, who did it, who, why didn't they? Let's review that. I think we're um, underserving our communities and ourselves if we just do that. Actually, where is the rest of that picture of that quality experience that that child had? So how do I know that that kid didn't get NCA level three without our intervention? Without yeah. intervention? How do I know? They could have just been gone through, because this was me, and my friend Louise Addison always says that, um, some of us are immune to bad teaching and we're just going to get through. Yeah. You know, what you put in front of me, I'm going to get there anyway, despite what you add to my kitty. Now, what if I'm not that person? How do I measure that actually a, a young person arrives in my kura and at the end, what do they look like? What has that story been for that individual that's really important so that when not, they walk away, they know that at Rotatuna Senior High School, these were the things that I was able to achieve and gain access to and be a part of, because those experiences are just as important as an NCA qualification. Awesome. You could, I, I like to call it the Pope, but you could call it the Pope, the, the um, portfolio of personal excellence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and I think yeah, it's about honouring what you say you're going to do and what you're going to believe in. And yeah, you know, if we say our um, vision statement is to connect, inspire, and soar, then I need to ensure that those three things are underpinned in every single curriculum that we offer in our school, and that there are multiple ways that kids can get there because a one size fits one model isn't accessible for everyone. No. Um, you know, and so, yeah. I think yeah, awesome. the, you know, the other thing that's probably worthwhile us discussing is actually how agile our tertiary are being in this space because yeah. the moment that they lost a huge... If they exist. 
Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But the moment they lost a huge funding stream, they started thinking differently. Now, I know that at Waikato University alone, they started engaging in an entrance in March, April in a different type of semester. So when they recognised they weren't going to get a whole heap of the international students in, they could, they were like, oh, hang on a minute, we might have to change the way we do things to be responsive to get that market in. When, when they met with us as principals and talked about that, I sort of said, well, shouldn't you have been doing that anyway? Because actually, you had a market there to begin with. It's called your own learners in, in New Zealand. And there were some kids that, because of the NCA mechanisms you put in place, might not have got there. Yeah. But we weren't agile enough to think about what it looked like for them and how do we support them to get into university in a different way rather than just put them on a whole year bridging course, which yeah. a lot of them don't need. So I think watching the university tick over in that space shows me that they've got a want and a responsiveness in this space to look at things differently. You know, I've yeah. heard that Otago University is contacting students to say, actually, we can take your level two information. We don't need to worry about your level three. We need that voice. We need, yeah. we need that communication from universities collectively around what actually is deemed important information and knowledge for them so that our students aren't anxious and can still access those pathways if they need to, because they're going to be my most anxious, I would imagine. Yeah. And so how do we do that? And then also, how do we get them to be um, better at wanting more information rather than just NCA? Because yeah. you know, sometimes when we want to learn something and we're really passionate about it, we can do bloody good at it. And, and that, that, yeah, and that, that fits so well. And like, I, I wrote a, a paper and a blog a, a, a couple of weeks ago now, just talking about that exact thing. Make level two your, your, your sort of your baseline data that you collect for. And then beyond that, you want it to be about personal definitions of excellence and success. And who's, who's I mean, who gives anyone the right to define your personal definition of success? Exactly. And um, well, no one does. Yeah. No. You want them to funnel into a system that believes that that little filtering um, matters. But it, it doesn't. And yes, resilience needs to happen at times. And less, yes, learning can happen in any way. And even when I don't get into something, that teaches me a hell of a lot too. But I think it's making sure the gates are open and oiled to allow free flow through to occur, not just actually... Yeah and monitored at such an extreme level. Actually, yeah. um, let, let's throw out some of our archaic, um, and I, well, I suppose in this analogy with the gates, let's chip away at the rust. Yeah, yeah. And exactly. look at things in a different way because, you know what, I've, I've been in education for a while now and I know frigging some amazing kids that might not have crossed that NCA UE line and they um, would have been fabulous in some careers. Oh, and and it's, our, it's ultimately our society and economy that actually suffers because we're missing out on such incredible talent pools that aren't recognised through traditional means. Yeah, and so I think um, this could afford us a space to actually re review that space um, and look with our tertiary space to acknowledge that um, our learners offer varying things other than just academic results. I'll, ma I'll make sure I forward this interview to every dean in the country. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll watch it. But no, I think it, uh, I absolutely agree with you, Tash, and that's an awesome point to end on. So um, I'm aware of the time, and so we'll wrap up our official part of the conversation here. Um, you, of course, are someone who's accessible either via Twitter or through our um, Disrupt Ed page on Facebook. I know you're an active part of that community, so people I'm can sure reach out. <laughs> you lurk. <laughs> I keep in every now and then and get on my soapbox. I swear to you, Hemi tries to hide my soapbox from me at moments because I bring it out and I pull it down and I stand on it and then I go, oh, okay. oh, oh heck. Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I'm there. I'm, I'm, I'm a lurker. 
Um, and I pipe up when I feel I need to. And thank you for letting me pipe up in this. Oh, I absolutely love it. I miss, you know, for people here don't know that we spent a beautiful nearly year together as, as buddies side, side by side at Team Solutions being the naughty corner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the days. Yeah, I don't know how our colleagues kind of really <laughs> felt the same. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Tash. So I'm going to just formally finish up and um, finish up the interview here. But for everyone that's watching, thank you so much for joining us today. There is a new interview um, that will appear on YouTube every morning. Um, pretty much every day, so do tune in. Also, if you've got a, a voice you'd like to share or someone you think we should speak to, make sure you let us know. Um, but until then, thank you for watching and enjoy all the future Disrupted interviews. Mm -hmm.